we're going to start by going through the knowledge assessments or the first part of the knowledge assessments. It's pretty um, more straightforward than the chapter two one, I think, maybe slightly more difficult than the chapter one one. Um, but we'll see. And yeah, there's one question in particular that we're going to discuss a little bit extra. I've got the PDF of your textbook open here. So this is on page 173. But let me just go back to where I was, because that's the one bit we're going to have to discuss. Um, I customized some of the questions slightly just because, uh, yeah, if you're following along with your book, it'll the, the answer will still be the same, okay? Um, even though the question might look a little bit different. Oh, no, I scrolled right past what I was looking for, I think. Uh, okay, that's the page I was looking for. Cool. So let's just jump into it. Chapter six, knowledge assessments. I don't know. I don't remember how long these knowledge assessments took previously. Ah, the vets made it this time. How was the wedding, guys? <laughs> okay, so I guess let's just get started. It's the same sort of format as the, the other lectures long ago when we did the, the last knowledge assessment that we did. Um, but yeah. So it starts with 10 fill in the blanks questions, then 10 multiple choice questions, as is usual. So the first question, in order for a table to be in the mm, none of the columns should have multiple values in the same row of data. Okay, so most of these fill in the blank questions, I think, except for number six, are pretty straightforward. This one you should get. So in order for a table to be in the mm, None of the columns should have multiple values in the same row of data. So what do we know about that specifies that none of the columns should have multiple values? Hey, even in the correct format. Yeah, that is correct. So one in F. That stands for first normal form, right? Our wedding was good as the photographer. Oh, okay. So yeah, not a, not a standard partying wedding when you're photographing the, the parties and stuff. Um, Weddings are fun though, especially if catering's nice. <laughs> but cool, cool. Okay, so the m mm requires that there is no functional dependency among non-key attributes. The m mm requires that there is no functional dependency amongst non-key attributes. Um, so yeah, these first three questions, okay, I, I switched them. The book had them. Yeah, okay, so this is not 2NF, this is 3NF. The, the book had them in a different order. So <laughs> the book had them in the order 1NF, 2NF, 3NF. So if you look at the book, I switched them around. Um, so, ooh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I am correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. I switched them around. In your book, the answers are 1NF, 2NF, 3NF. I just, I thought that, I thought that putting it in order was just like too easy, you know? So I, I'm... <laughs> So I switched them. But yeah, in your book, the answer to question one is 1NF, the answer to question two is 2NF, and the answer to question three is 3NF. Okay, so those first three, quite silly, just to do try to remember the rules, but we'll revise them in more detail before you write and stuff. Um, but but now we can get into like questions that are that don't give you the answer by <laughs> the numbering. Um, okay, so question four, the basic attributes of an entity relationship diagram are this one was surprising to me because I remember we did the Mentimeter quiz and a lot of people got this wrong. Okay, entity attribute relationship. Is everyone in agreement on this, guys? Yes, okay, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so it is entity attribute relationship. And you remember what they were because, and, and don't get confused between like class and entity. I mean, I hope that by mentioning it, I didn't confuse you. Um, but yeah, so they, they are similar ideas, but yeah, so these are in relation to databases. Um, but yeah, I mean, fairly straightforward question so far, I reckon. This one, interesting. So the mm clause in a select statement evaluates each row for a condition and decides whether to include it in the result set. The mm clause in a select statement evaluates each row for a condition and decides whether to include it in a result set. Okay, yeah, it is where. 
Um, we've only seen this, an example of this really in two different contexts. So I figured I'd show you one more. So I did set up like a little database in DB Fiddle. Um, you guys can go to, I posted the link in the chat. I'll post all of my code in chat as well. So this is a data set, I mean, or a, a database that relates customers to orders, okay? Or orders to customers. Um, so I'll show you each of the tables and that I've got there. So I'm gonna say select star from customers. So that's gonna select all of the columns from the customers table. And it'll also select every single row, right? Cause there's no where statement. So none of the rows are excluded. Um, so if I run that, uh, you can see we've got five customers. We've got Ali, South Africa, or Guatemala, Devon from South Africa, Kevin from France, and Peter from the United Kingdom, okay? So we've got three columns in the table, ID, name, and region. And the ID is obviously just an integer, uh, and the other two are just varchars, right? Strings, basically. Um, so that's just a sort of simple customers table. I've then also got the orders table. So select star from orders. Um, and yeah, so these are fairly straight. Don't ask, it's an inside joke. I was, I was just trying to think of what items to, to order. So customer two ordered a toilet seat pedal from for a hundred rand. Um, I am not sure why we have all of these different items. Customer one ordered a necklace for 3000 rand. And customer four ordered um, the tricolor for 20 rand. Okay, this is the name of the French flag, by the way. Um, but whatever, we've got an arbitrary, some arbitrary item name. We've got the ID of the order, the ID of the customer who ordered it, and the price. Okay, um, by the way, you've never seen storing numbers like this in a database before. Um, you see where they have decimals. Like I could make the tricolor cost 20. Um, 20, whatever this currency is, 2050, okay? So you see it's got 2050 there now, 20.5 basically. So that's called a decimal inside SQL. Does anyone remember what would we, if we were trying to store this kind of thing inside C sharp, what type would we use? Floats, ooh, 50%. Okay, so yeah, floats or double, okay. So long just stores, is like a long integer, okay. So long is like a, but yeah, yeah, double, double's correct, okay. <laughs> cool. No, I mean, fair enough. It's been a while since we, since we uh, did any C sharp. We'll do some today. Well, any C sharp that wasn't related to like forms or websites or any of that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll do, so, we'll do a little bit today maybe. Um, okay, cool. But we, we have a basic sort of database going. Hopefully you get what's going on. We could also join the two tables together using that inner join statement. Maybe we'll see that a bit later. Um, but cool. What I wanted to show you here is just the where statement, right? So if I say select star from customers, remember the star is specifying is in place for all of the columns, right? So if I only wanted the name of the customers, I could say select name from customers. And then in, instead of getting all of the columns, it just gets the name column, okay? So select name from customers. Now we could make some extra exclusions, right? So we, cause now it just selects the name column but it selects every single row. So if we want to exclude certain rows or only include certain rows um, based on some kind of condition, then we use the where statements, okay? So we can say select name from customers where, let's say we only, we're looking for our South African customers. So we can say where region equals South Africa, for example, where region equals South Africa, okay? And so now um, you see it only shows Ali and Devon because if we look um, at our table, uh, those are the only two customers that we have from South Africa, okay? If we wanted where region is not South Africa, does anyone remember what operator can I change this to to make it not South Africa? Because there's a bunch of operators. Um, does anyone remember which, what the symbol exclamation point? Uh, you're thinking in C sharp now though, guys. You could put not at the beginning um, I think that should work. So if we say where not region equals South Africa, uh, let's try that out. 
Yeah, okay, so that worked. It gave us all Kevin and Peter, okay? There's a better way than that, though. There's a better way than that, though. Or it's not better. I mean, this works. But the other way, okay, there's another way to do it. There's this symbol here. If you put a less than sign next to a greater than sign, it's like saying either less than or greater than, right? So it's like not equal to. So this is like region, not South Africa, okay? That like less than, like this sign, less than, greater than, okay? So it's like, you know, either less than or greater than is kind of like the same as not equal to. Okay. And you see it does the same thing. It gives us all Kevin and Peter. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to get to the same goal. Um, but yeah, so this was, yeah, I, I guess you can get creative, I suppose, is, is the point of that. Cool. But yeah, so it's the where clause. There we go. We've got another basic example of the where clause. That's sort of the third different database that you've seen a where clause used in. Um, and plus all of the database modules. So I guess maybe you, you're pretty okay with that stuff. Okay. So question six. Ah, okay. This, this is the one that I was saying we're going to need to discuss a little bit extra. Because um, honestly, this is just, this is, this question is about like the discussion of this concept well we we i don't know this this one but we haven't even really we haven't covered this interface specifically or or we did once i guess we did discuss the i disposable interface okay the answer here is i disposable don't worry if you've never heard about this before because this question is basically about one sentence in the book okay so let me just show you the book, the textbook's coverage of this. Okay, so I'm on page 164 here. You see, now the textbook's coverage of this concept is not this page. Um, it's this little note here. That little note. Okay, I zoomed in way too much. Um, I don't know why my laptop's so slow. Weird. Um, it's this little note in the top left here on page 164. It says. The object used with the using statement must implement the I disposable interface. That is all the discussion of this concept <laughs> in the book. And um, yeah, and they ask you this question, which is honestly a bit hilarious. Um, but yeah, so this is a very obscure concept. I'll show you um, what they're talking about now. Yeah, it, it, it is a bit silly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's not difficult. It's just, it's just a bit silly. Okay. So anyway, I'll show you about it in Rex Tester. Um, and, and then you'll understand. Um, so they use, they use the word using. So you've seen using at like the top of a file and you know, it means like we're importing a namespace into our file, um, into, into our code, but they, they, you can also use the word using inside your code like this. Okay. And it makes it look a little bit complicated, but it's, um, it's actually fairly straightforward once you once you figure it out. Okay, but you can see they use the word using inside the code here, and I'll now show you just what that does. It's like a very simple idea, actually. Okay, so over here I've got I'm I'm in Rex Tester now. Um, just got some basic code basically. Um, we've got a name basic code basically. Let me just put my phone on silent quick. Oh, it, it's one of you guys messaging me. Hi, sir. I can't make it to class today. I'll watch the recording. Okay. Um, so we're inside namespace Rex tester. Okay, namespace Rex tester. Um, public class program, public class rectangle. Okay, so I've got two classes. Um, one is just the standard class with main inside it. Okay, so this is the main part of the program. And then we've got public class rectangle, which is just that rectangle class which we've used endless amounts of times. It's got this thing. What is this method called, guys? What do we call this method? What's the special name for it? Okay, you you know you can see its name is rectangle, but that's not what I mean. Okay, yeah, constructor, constructor. Okay, everyone's everyone's on board. Okay, cool. So it is rectangle, um, and it is the constructor for for the class, and it takes in a length and a width, and it sets length to to the length and width to the width. Um, and you guys know that by by length here, what we basically mean is this dot length, right? Because it's this rectangle's length. Okay. But anyway, cool. So um, yeah, that's a class and that's hopefully fine. Um, and what we can do here is we can create a rectangle object, which we do by saying rectangle rect equals new rectangle. 
right? Something like that. And we can give it a length and a width, okay? Like so. So that'll create a new thing, a new object of type rectangle. Um, and it has a length of 10 and a width of 20. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm just taking it slow because it's been a while since you guys have seen this stuff. Um, now, what the using statement is essentially for is two things. Number one, it's kind of, okay, no, the, the first thing and the main thing to remember about it is that it's for scope. It's for defining what we call the scope of a variable. Okay, so I can, I can give you a brief example of that. If, if, we, if we created another variable here called public string rect, okay, this will be fine. Okay, this code is fine because this rect is different from this rect, right? And we can make it even more simpler than that. We could create another variable here called length, okay? This length is different from this length. It's fine. Okay. This the the length over here um, inside this this method would be at rect dot length, and rect dot length is different from length. Okay. Rect dot length is different from length. Okay. Because this length is inside class rectangle, and this length is inside class program. So what, what we call that, that like concept that these variables are in different places, we call that the scope of the variable, the scope of the variable. Okay, it's scope. Um, so using basically allows you to manipulate the scope a little bit. And it's, it's not really new because I have showed you this before where, so system, we've been using system. And so at the top here, we say using system. What that means is anything inside the system namespace you you can just treat it as if it is scoped to this document, okay, to the C sharp program. That's its scope. Anything inside using its scope is this document. So what do we mean by that? Instead of writing system dot console, okay, because we said using system, so system scope is this file. Like um, system is fully scoped inside globally scoped. We would call it inside this program. Instead of writing system.console.writeline, we can just write console.writeline, okay? And it automatically knows that the console we're talking about is the console inside system, okay? Because we said using system. And saying using anywhere else in your code is the same idea. Um, so I'll give you possibly the simplest demonstration of this you could get. I'm going to say rect.length over here. So I'm going to say console.writeline, console.write rect.length, okay? Rect.length. Now, um, if I just run this, you can see it just prints out 10. That's the length of our rectangle. Rect.length is 10, right? Because we gave it to the constructor as 10. So L was 10 and we said length equal to L. And that length is owned by um, by any object of type rectangle. Okay, so rect dot length is ten. Now you can see that it might be it might be nice later on for me to sort of distinguish between um, what's going on here, like this object, as having a more specific scope, right? Because currently its scope is the entire main method. Rect can be used inside the main method. So you can imagine if I had like hundred, a thousand lines of code here, and later on I created another thing of type rectangle, I was like, okay, I forgot that, I forgot that rect was used. I forgot the name rect was used, and I decided to create another thing of type rect. You could see how that could get quite confusing. You would have to remember all of your variable names. And especially when it comes to things like databases, where you're using a variable name like connection, you're probably gonna want to use connection in other contexts as well, right? It's a very natural name to tend towards. So you want to be more specific about the scope than just let it go anywhere at once in the method. And with using, you can do that. So I'm just gonna type it out and maybe maybe um, you'll, you'll get it. So I can say using and I can wrap with here where I create rectangle, I can wrap that in, in the using block, okay? So you see, I said using, I've got some brackets open. So this is all inside the using statement. 
this rectangle rect equals new rectangle. It's all inside using. Now, what I can do is I can say, I can define some curly brackets here. Okay. And now rect, this rect object is only defined. It's scope, it's scope where you can use the rect object. This particular rect object is inside these curly brackets after the using statement. Okay. Um, so I'll demonstrate more clearly, but for now, when I run this, it's going to give me a problem. Okay. It's going to, it's going to complain. So if I run this, you can see it says the rectangle, the rectangle type used in a using statement must be implicitly convertible to system.i disposable. Okay. So that's a long way of saying that you must just say that this implements the I disposable interface. So how we do that is we say colon I disposable. Okay. And you guys remember that different interfaces, we, we defined interfaces long ago for, for like enemies and weapons, right? We defined those two interfaces. And the interfaces require that you implement a method, right? So our interfaces require that you implement, that you implement an attack method, right? An attack method. So when I run this, um, yeah, well, it's an interface. It's an interface. Yeah, an interface. Um, but yeah, an interface is basically just a public abstract class. It's a fancy way of saying that, basically. Um, there are some other differences, though, because you can you can implement multiple interfaces, which you can't do with classes, okay? You can't inherit from, like, you can't inherit from one class, comma, another class, but you can do that with interfaces. So there are some, like, slight differences, but until you get to, like, I don't know, I mean you would have to be going really deep into C sharp in order to actually want to uh, heavily prioritize those little distinctions. But yeah, so um, like maybe if you're the person who programmed the iDisposable interface, then you would probably want to take note of that kind of stuff. Um, but for now, uh, you guys are already maybe a bit ahead of the curve on this stuff. Okay, so, um, so, but methods require you to, I mean, interfaces require you to implement these various methods. Our interfaces required you to implement that attack method. This interface requires that you implement a method called dispose okay and that's fairly simple to do literally all you have to do is say public void dispose okay there we go i've implemented the dispose method it's done okay now what you could do here we're not going to discuss this now because literally as i mentioned the text this is the only question they would ever ask you about i disposable and all the coverage it gets in the book is this little note so we're not going to spend too much time discussing this little red herring that they put in the book. Um, but like what you could use do and dispose is you you dispose of things that like are taking up memory, right? So um, you can imagine uh, a good example, that data set that we were using in the previous lecture, that data set was saving 9,972 names into our memory. That's like, that's, a, that's taking up space. You want to delete that when when you're done and in order to do that you use something called a garbage collector very well named um but yeah so but for now this will work uh you don't have to actually put anything yeah it, it is it is cool so it, it just cleans up your memory but c sharp does usually do this for you mostly automatically that's the advantage of using c sharp over some of over like older languages like c um or less abstract languages like c um, where you have to handle garbage collection yourself, but C Sharp and Java handle garbage collection for you. So you don't have to really think about cleaning up memory. It's just in very specific cases. If you want to be able to do it yourself, you can do it in this method. But you can see I left the method totally empty and it works. Okay. So what this question is asking, it says the object used with the using statements must implement the I disposable interface. So all they're saying is, if you want to use an object like rectangle inside the using statement to define its scope, it has to implement I disposable. That's all they're saying. Um, I know it's a very niche, very weird question for them to be asking. Um, so yeah, sorry, but it is, uh, I mean, it's not too bad. It's just difficult to remember, I guess. Um, and now what you can see if, if I say console rect.length over here, rect.length, so you can see I'm outside of the using statement now, okay? So rect is no longer scoped here. So when I run this, um, you can see it says, so it's saying line 19, that's the line we're on here, line 19. It's saying the name rect 
does not exist in the current context, okay? Context is just another way of saying scope. Um, context and scope is the same thing. Um, so yeah, here you can see that rect is no longer defined because it's only defined inside the using statements, okay? So it's just an easy way to define scope. You're very seldomly gonna um, be using this before you take up like a very professional development career, I reckon. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Good to know that it exists, I guess. Um, and yeah, so that's that question. Um, probably a little bit overkill to be covering that, especially if it's like your first year of programming. Um, that's uh, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird to know that I disposable exists and garbage collectors and stuff, but whatever. Um, introduction to software development. <laughs> okay, um, on to the next question. So now they're all more sensible. From here on out, I think all the questions are, are more sensible. So they say, SQL's mm statement can be used to create a stored procedure. SQL's mm statement can be used to create a stored procedure. So this is basically asking, what statement did we use when we wanted to create a stored procedure? Anyone remember? I mean, SQL, it's not too bad, right? It's basically English. Yeah, okay. Procedure, that's half of what you need, I think, for this question. I mean, this is what's nice about it. Um, the final test being like multiple choice and like drag and drop almost. So you won't, you won't get caught out with things like this, but that's half of the answer that they're expecting to this particular question. Um, there's like a word that comes before procedure. Hmm. I mean, I, you know what? Close enough. Close enough. I'm going to say close enough. They, they were expecting you to say create procedure. Okay. So that's like the full statement, full statement. Because um, <laughs> you can, you can also like update procedure, for example, or, or delete procedure. So just the word procedure doesn't, uh, doesn't fully encapsulate the what they're asking, right? Because they're asking you specifically um, can be used to create a stored procedure, okay? Um, I think modify is also a word you can use with procedures. Um, but yeah, getting getting pretty specific, but not bad, not bad. Uh, like if you, you can picture yourself, if you were in the exam and they gave you like four options to like drag and drop into this blank, hopefully you would pick create procedure, right? And also, I mean, with SQL in particular, it's pretty, you know, how would you create a stored procedure? Create procedure is probably a pretty good, uh, good guess. Um, so, okay, on to the next one. Eight, in the process of mm, you apply certain rules to ensure that your database design helps with data integrity and ease of maintenance in the future. In the process of mm, you apply certain rules to ensure that your database design helps with data integrity and ease of maintenance in the future. What's the answer there? We kind of spoke about like the three rules. Hey, okay. Yeah, that, that is it. Normalization. Okay, normalization. Yeah, so in the process of normalization, you apply certain rules. What rules are they talking about? 1NF, 2NF, 3NF, right? Um, and the entire purpose of that process is that you have data integrity. What does data integrity protect your database from, guys? Does anyone remember? What does data integrity protect the database from? As just a side question while we're here. What are those three things that can occur? Hey, okay, yeah. Amilcar, correct. Anomalies. Anomalies, okay. So that's why we want to normalize so that we avoid. Um, does anyone remember what the three anomalies that can occur are? I, I know I'm asking a lot, but it, 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 is, it is good revision though. It is good revision. Update, delete, and insert. That's correct. Okay, cool. Um, on to the next question. So number nine. The mm namespace provides classes for working with streams and backing stores. The mm namespace provides classes for working with streams 
and backing stores. Which namespace is that? I think we discussed this, was it last week or the week before? Might have been the week before when we discussed streams. Yeah, I think so. The week before last when we discussed streams. So there were two in particular that you had to remember. File streams. So um, I was like stream. Hey, okay, yeah. I'm impressed. Cool. Yes, it is system.io. System.io. Uh, anyone want to take a guess at what IO stands for? <laughs> IO. What does this stand for? Input output. Yes, good guess. Well, or, or not a guess. I mean, I imagine that was quite an educated guess. What else could it stand for, right? Yeah, so IO stands for input output. And guys, that should be the idea of inputting and outputting things should be very closely related for you to the idea of streams, right? Because you can think about it like when you say console.writeline, console.writeline, and you put a string here, okay? Um, like, uh, I don't know, hello. Yeah, so if we put a string here, how is this going? To, how does this get to the console? This we can imagine you guys know this is like a simulation of a console based application. That's all Rex test is. So how does it get to the console? That's the stream, right? It came from this backing store, like inside our code, the string um, in, inside memory to the backing store of the console. And how did it get there? It got there over a stream. Okay. So the all ideas of input and outputs, and like we can do the reverse as well. If we say console.readline, then we go from, then we're going from the console to the program, right? So it's just the stream runs in the opposite direction. Okay. And yeah, so it's all about like input and output streams. That's actually what they're called, input and output streams. Okay. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so system.io, it should be very closely connected in your head to the idea of a, of a stream, okay? Anyway, um, the M format is a hierarchical data representation format. This one, to be honest, is a little bit vague because there are more than one of these, but um, yeah, I think more than one format definitely corresponds. Although they are asking you specifically here because they say format. So they're asking for a file format. And actually thinking about it now, there is actually only one file format that we learned about that is a hierarchical data representation, I think. Although HTML could probably be described as also like a hierarchical data representation. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, they are talking about that. They are talking about XML. Um, this one I'm a little bit suspicious of, but I imagine like if they were if they were giving if they were giving you like the options, I imagine they're not going to put like a, a vague option like that. Um, I, they'll make it quite clear that what they're asking for is XML. But in in this particular definition, there is definitely more than one possible answer here. Um, but hey, it's it's a hard knock life. Okay. Um, Okay, we have like 10 more minutes until we can take a little break. So we can get started with the multiple choice. Um, okay, I, we, yeah, let's go. So yeah, that was the fill in the blanks, not too bad. Here's the first multiple choice question. Your application needs to store an image of a product. Okay, um, we'll say, oh dang, that was quick. Um, so your application needs to store an image of a product in a disk file. You'd like to minimize the size of the disk file. Which of the following would you use to write the image to the file? Okay, so they ask you file stream, stream writer, binary writer, or XML writer. Okay, and already two people have answered it is C, binary writer, um, because usually we would save, um, in fact, I did show you this once before when we were talking about arrays. I showed you in Python, so not directly related, but um, like you can just represent an image as just zeros and ones or, or zeros to 255s rather. Um, so yeah, 
you, we do write these things in binary. And like 255 is very, a very easy number to convert to binary, right? So that makes sense. Um, Cool, so binary write is correct here. Stream writer, we would use for writing a text file, right? XML writer, we would use for writing to an XML file, obviously. Um, so then you would have to specify nodes and XML elements. And that first line, which um, maybe someone can post in the chat what the name of that first line is in XML. What do we call the stuff specified in that first line? Um, Okay, well, maybe while people think of that, we can go on to question two. So your C-sharp program needs to return. Okay, that's what should say return. Um, your C-sharp program needs to return the total number of customers in a database. The program will be used several times every single day. What is the fastest way to return this information from your program? Fastest. Remember, they're asking for fastest here. Typo with A. Is there a typo in A as well? So option A is write an SQL query and use the execute scalar method to execute the query. Um, is it? No, no, no. It is dot execute scalar. That's fine, I think. And then they say writer. Oh, did I spell execute wrong? I don't know. Scala. Okay, I, I don't see it. Anyway, so they say write a stored procedure and use execute scalar to execute the procedure. Write a SQL query and use sql.adapter.fill to execute the query and create a stored procedure. Okay, let's discuss this one because this one is interesting. So do you guys remember what S what is it an XML declaration? XML declaration. Are you saying the first line of the XML file? The question I was asking you guys on the previous page. Yeah, yeah, so XML declaration or processing instructions, either one, um, but yeah, I'm impressed, uh, good job. Okay, yeah, that's good, and you got that. Um, so, hmm, let's think about this. So, hmm, there's two parts of this question, right? The first part is basically asking you whether, she, whether you should use an SQL query or whether you should use a procedure. And the second part of this question is asking you about whether you should execute the command using execute scalar or SQL adapter.fill. Okay, so those are the two parts of this question and they ask like every combination of those two options. Perhaps, perhaps, let's discuss it, let's discuss it. So let's, let's just address the first part of the question. Should we use a query or should we use a procedure? Should we use a query or should we use a procedure? So if we read like the the main parts, okay. So which what tells us that we should definitely be using a procedure here, guys? What is the big giveaway here? That's yeah, exactly. The fact that the program will be used several times every single day. You do not want to have to type out the entire query. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Everyone's got. Yeah. So you shouldn't. You do not want to have to type out the entire query over and over and over again. So the, the program will be used several times every day. That's what's telling us that we need to use a procedure. What's, so then the second part of the question, so they say, what is the fastest way to return this information from your program? So we need to think about what they mean by information. What are we doing? What are we doing? What problem are we solving? So they say, the program needs to return the total number of customers in a database. The total number of customers. So that is what, like what, what kind of information is that? Um, let me ask you this way, how many rows of information? Exactly, it's returning a single element, right? One integer. In fact, I can show you this command now, like this is the command that we would put inside the procedure. If we do this, so select star from customers, I'm gonna say, so select star from customers. Okay, so that's gonna give us the entire customer's table. That's not what they want us to do. They want us to count the number of items here. So the probably the best way to do this is to just wrap the star, the asterisk inside a count statement. Count star, select count star. Okay, and you can see this now returns one cell. It just returns five. 
okay? Because that's the number of customers in our database. Makes sense, in our table rather. Um, so select count star from customers. So that's the query. This is the query that we would be putting inside the stored procedure. So it's asking, what is the fastest way to run this, the, run this information? Okay. Um, and so the, the fastest way, the best way to, like what execute scalar does, if you guys remember, it was quite a while when we covered it though. Um, what execute scalar does is that it just returns the first cell of whatever query you get. It just returns the first cell. In this case, we only have one cell, so it returns the entire response, um, but it just has one cell. And the advantage of execute scalar is that it's very quick because it, it knows that it only has to care about that one cell. So it doesn't think about any more information than that. It doesn't make any more, um, yeah, it doesn't use any more storage than that. So yes, it is B. So why is it not fill though? So like fill is almost the opposite of this. Fill will return the entire response. And yeah, yeah. So fill will return the entire response. But the big thing about it is that it's also stores it in memory. Okay. So fill is very slow. The, the advantage of using an SQL adapter, though, um, or, or so remember SQL adapters, what they do is fill data sets. So you would usually use an SQL adapter and a data set. And the data set stores the memory, it stores the information in your memory. And the advantage of that is it's very dynamic. It's adaptive. Okay, so try to remember it that way. SQL adapter, it can adapt the data in your memory. Okay, whereas execute scalar just reads it. It's very dumb in a way, but that's what makes it fast. Okay, it's, it doesn't save anything to your memory, rarely. It just goes, um, just tells the data, you do what you want with it. Okay, um, so yeah, execute scalar. Anyway. Interesting question. Um, have to break it down a little bit into like what the things they're asking are. Okay, but yeah, yeah, nice, Alex. So question three, you need to update the employees table by marking certain employees as working from home when the notice field is true and the hours in office field is zero. Okay, so when those two things are true. Uh, so where is execute scalar in the book? Uh, we can try to find it. Um, I know I have it in the one slide, but yeah, it is a bit, uh, let me just control F, the advantage of having a PDF, although geez, it is very slow to search. Yeah. I don't know why this PDF editor that Google has is so slow. Maybe I should just download this. Okay, I'm downloading it and then we'll find it. It should be somewhere here uh, where we see uh, run parameterized stored procedures from C sharp. Actually, this could be it. Uh, do they give you the different ways you can run it here? Or, okay, let me just see if this works now. Okay, I'll open it like this. Okay, this should be a little bit quicker. Execute scalar. Uh, okay, we need to jump through the book. Are you you're already asked answering the next question, Adam? <laughs> um, okay, where are we currently? We're still in object oriented programming. Okay, jumping forward. Uh, but yeah, no, this is an important question. Although the book is always a little bit. Uh, as you saw with I disposable, ah, execute SQL. Okay, we're, we're, it's gonna be somewhere around here. Uh, SQL query analyzer, C sharp application, fair enough. The Northwind database, select, update, insert. Uh, yeesh, this book. Uh, I know they do use it some and select execute the result from a stored procedure wrong parameterized stored procedures. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, if if this book was your only source for what am I talking about that it was my only source for studying. Um, it really probably does not prepare you for the test optimally the book. Uh, okay, it'll, it's, it'll be somewhere around here though. Uh, let me just see. 
Okay, uh, maybe not. Execute, execute SQL, okay. Execute non-query. Okay, so there they used execute non-query. So execute non-query. Does anyone remember what this returns if you use execute non-query? So there's execute data, I mean, execute reader, execute non-query, and execute scalar. Those are the three that you have to remember. Execute non-query does a very specific thing. Uh, if someone can tell us what it is while I find this other one. Okay, there's execute reader. And there's, oh wow, the first mention of ex execute scalar. That's shocking. Honestly, that's shocking. <laughs> the first um, mention of execute scalar in the book is in the second question. Okay. Um, so <laughs> oh, that is funny. Um, it, it would be funny at least it, if it's not, if it weren't so uh, sad. Um, Okay, but I'll I'll just I'll I'll just explain it again because um, maybe it's worth doing. So there were these three ways. Okay, so an execute reader, what that returns is called an SQL data reader, which is a forward only way, and it returns the entire result. Okay, so if you use execute reader for this, so I'm gonna just I'll give you an example of this. So select star from customers. Okay. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it does return something though very specific. So here, select star from customers. So if we ran this response, what the ex what execute reader would do is it would return an SQL data reader that has the entire response stored in it, okay? The entire response. Remember though, it's forward only though, okay? So it's not the same as using a SQL adapter.fill because that returns everything into the computer's memory, okay? Um, this just returns a forward only way of reading through the information. If you execute the same query with execute scalar, it would just return this one. It would just return one because that's the top left cell. Okay, that's all it will return is just one. Okay, so it'll only return the first cell. So first row, first column, the first cell. Um, and that's what execute scalar does. And execute non query, as Adam says, it's when you, it's when statements that don't return any information. But more importantly than that, what it returns is the number of rows that were affected by your query, okay? The number of rows. So if you delete certain information from the data and you end up deleting three rows from your, from your table, then it will return the number three, okay? Um, if you update 15 rows, it will return the number 15, okay? That's what execute non-query does. Execute scalar just returns the first cell um, and it's very fast. That's what's great about it. And um, execute reader. And yeah, uh, sorry, Maya, that the book, um, maybe I think, so chapter six, I put a lot of information in the slide, basically everything except this singular note, which is a bit annoying. Um, but uh, hopefully you can study, you can study from the slides for chapter six, uh, mostly, I think particularly for execute scalar, apparently. Um, wow, that is really just, uh, <laughs> but yeah, sorry that the book can be a little bit, this is like the ult ultimate presumption. Like where do they think you would get this information? It's not like execute scalar would be a standard thing for a person to know. I uh, know, I mean, it's no problem, it's no problem. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, okay, we can we can take a break because uh, that, that took a little bit longer than I thought. Um, so yeah, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back at four. Um, it looks like we might actually use the whole lesson, but I guess that's not a bad thing. Because uh, that means at least there's been some questions and stuff. Uh, sorry, sir, I won't be joining either. I won't be either, sorry. Okay, I guess everyone's uh, winding up for exams now. Hey? Cool, I'm gonna just go grab a glass of water, guys. I'll be back now.
I guess, I, I mean, the previous knowledge assessments also took us a while to get through. How many cues are there in the exam? There are 35. Quite a lot. I guess, yeah, only 35. It depends how you look at it. 35 might be, but yeah, not, not too bad, I guess. And yeah, mostly multiple choice, but also like drag and drop. So where they give you a bunch of options, but I guess that's kind of like multiple choice anyway. So yeah, multiple choice. I think there's also like one or two. They don't do it often. Do we write at a venue? Um, this year, it's a bit up in the air. There might be like a Microsoft might have something that you guys can use to write virtually and some like fancy monitoring systems and whatever. But um, no, we, we want to write at the school, definitely. Um, but obviously that requires brighter futures to discuss stuff with your uh, principals and teachers and stuff. But yeah, the current plan is to write at, at your school. Yeah. It, also, the revision session will probably be done at a school. We're not sure if it'll be Crawford. Um, Although Crawford does have very nice grounds, so that would be a good place for it. But um, yeah, it'll be at a school. And what we're planning is like, there'll be more than just one tutor. So essentially there'll be multiple classes fusing at this one place, but obviously that's um, maybe a bit ambitious given the current climate. How long do we get to write the exam? I actually forget. I think it's like a hour and I'm not sure. Sorry, I forgot. You'll probably finish early though, because uh, you work through multiple choice quite quickly, especially after all the revision. Um, I think it's like, I think you get given an hour, about an hour. Mark a minute or so. But the, yeah, so the plan is we'll do that kind of thing, but we'll get like a recorder, like a camera at the back of the class um, and just record the lecture basically. For, for any students who either aren't comfortable or don't want to go to the revision session. And that'll be like five hours on a Saturday. So that'll probably be on the 28th of November, the 28th of November. So the first Saturday after your exams. And then the plan is to write in like either the first or second week of December, depending on like everyone's schedule and how everyone's feeling. But yeah, plenty of time for revision. So we're doing two revision sessions. One is five hours and the other is two hours. The first one will be like content revision and the second one will be lots and lots of questions, like just uh, test prep almost. I think it should be good. Um, yeah, should be okay. But yeah, the revision, doing lots of revision is important, especially after you guys have a whole month of thinking about other stuff. Um, so yeah, the revision will be important. Ooh, geez, why is my battery so dead? One second.
Okay. Now my battery will last till the end of the lecture at least. Will the exam use big words to try to confuse us? Uh, yeah, that's almost their go-to. But don't worry, by then you, you'll have seen so many of these questions because um, we're going to do like lots of them in the revision session. Um, and we'll give you guys resources like where you can just log on and go through question after question after question. Yeah, like this one. And you'd be surprised, like I imagine if we do some of the older knowledge assessments, you'll be surprised at how much you remember. Because, uh, I don't know, they do use the right words, easy query, but, but complex wording. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like this question has so much irrelevant information in it. <laughs> like the majority of the question is irrelevant. Like all you need is the first four words and the word table. You need or five words. You need to update the table. Which of the following statements should you use? That's kind of where the question ends. <laughs> but then they say all this other stuff. Okay, uh, let's jump into it again. Okay, so uh, we've been discussing this question now. So, uh, but yeah, I saw you, you said C very long ago. Um, so yeah, uh, you need to update the employees table by marking certain employees as working from home when the notice field is true and the hours in office field is zero. Which of the following statements should you use? Okay, so yeah, it, there's a lot of red herrings in this question. The basic thing is though, they tell you that what you wanna do is update the employees table and the way we update tables in SQL is update. Okay, I could show you that here. Oh, sorry, the neighbor is um, a bit of a weirdo doing uh, construction work at all hours of the day. I hope it's not too distracting for you guys. I can move if it is. Uh, nice Wi-Fi name. Oh yeah, get off my LAN. Yeah. Uh, that was a while back when we chose that one. Um, anyway, cool. So that's that. Um, on to the next thing. Okay. You need to update the region field. You can hear that, right? That I I'm very sorry. My apologies. Okay, question four. You need to update the region field for customers in South Africa. You write the following statements. Update regions, customer, uh, wait, update customers, set region equals Southern Africa. Okay, a small bit is fine because for me it's deafening. Um, so I, I'm glad it's not as bad. So update customers, set region equals Southern Africa. When you test this, it does not work. How can you fix it? Okay, um, so instead of just looking at these questions, just don't even don't even look at the possible answers yet. When I show you this statement, update customers set region equals Southern Africa, what will that do, guys? Why is it obviously wrong, that, that statement? From what we just saw of the select statement, 
Um, and what we've seen of the update statements and the delete statement. Okay, yeah, no, okay, no, <laughs> no semicolon. That is true. Okay, let's pretend there was a semicolon there. Um, there's a very fundamental problem with what with with this statement. Very fundamental problem. Update customers set region equals Southern Africa. And it's the same problem that exists always. I mean, like if I um, jump back to jump back to this, it's it's the same thing that the select statement does, right? So this says select star from customers. You need a where statement, yeah, yeah. But there, I, I don't know, I do wanna just make sure though, why, why? No field specifies to set. They do say set region equals Southern Africa. So it's gonna set the region column. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is gonna set every single region in the database to Southern Africa. So if we look at our example here, okay? So here we have multiple regions, right? We have South Africa, Guatemala, South Africa, France, and the United Kingdom, okay? If I say um, update customers, update customers, or update customers sets uh, region equals, so we're changing South Africa to like Southern Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, whatever you wanna call it. I'm just gonna say Southern, Southern Africa. Um, so if I run this and then obviously I have to run a select because update doesn't return anything. It'll just tell me the number of rows affected maybe. Um, but we would have to say select star from customers to actually see the results of this. Okay, select star from customers. So if I run this, you can see it updated every single region to Southern Africa, which you would always assume is not your intention. <laughs> you would always assume is not your intention. In fact, I think in the question in the, in the book, they give slightly more detail than this. It's slightly different, but the answer is the same. Okay. So how do we fix this? We need to exclude certain rows, right? We need to add a condition. And basically what we have to do is say, okay, what's A, let me just double check. So they say add a where clause to the update statement. That's correct, yeah. So what we're gonna do is say, we, we wanna update customers. We wanna set region to Southern Africa, but only where region equals South Africa. Okay, only where region equals South Africa. And then we can run that. And now you can see that the two regions that had Southern Africa, um, I mean, that had South Africa on our Southern Africa and, um, and the other regions are still the same. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so it is A and, and that's how we fix it. Okay, so the problem initially is if you don't put a where statement, and this is with all the SQL statements, right? Um, like deletes, updates and selects. Um, I mean, those are, the, those are the three main ones. So those all of all three of those statements will work on every single row unless you specify otherwise okay you need to add the condition or then it'll just assume that you're changing every row okay but yeah so so a is the answer here uh add a where clause to the update statements the other ones i mean we can go through them so add another set clause to the update statements obviously that's just going to change every single row and it'll change another column although you don't even have to add another set okay there's no reason why you would do that okay Add a group by clause to the update statements, uh, not particularly relevant. Add a having clause to the update statement, not particularly relevant, okay. Um, group by just allows you to maybe like group everyone who's from Southern Africa, right? Like you can say group by region. Um, I, can, I can just show you actually. Um, so we're gonna say group, I'm not sure how well it will work with this because Ah, we need to be more, um, this is incompatible with SQL mode. Okay, no, so it's, it, this is like a versioning problem. Um, I could show you, it, it like, it just, it just, it would just put the South Africa's next to each other and the Guatemala's next to each other. You can also use order by to like order it in like alphabetical order or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's fine. You would also see more about this in the database modules, but like the, the answer would never be these. Okay. Um, but yeah, group by does exist and yeah, it just groups things. Okay. All of, all of the SQL things do just sound like what their name is. Okay. Um, 
So you are developing a C sharp program that will retrieve a large list of customers from an SQL server database. Okay, a large list of customers, large list of customers. Um, the application, sorry, okay, the, the application, um, the, wait, the application needs to move. Okay, that should be needs to move. So the application needs to move through the data sequentially, processing each item once. Which of the following classes should you use to hold this list most efficiently? Okay, so they give you some useful information for answering this question. So they say you are developing a C-sharp program. It's a large list of customers. Okay, so that's almost assumed we're working with the database, okay? The application must move through the data sequentially processing each item once, okay? Each item once. So do we use a data set, a data table, a data view or an SQL data reader. Okay, someone says A, interesting. So we're going for A. What's the big advantage of using a data set? Over using, for example, okay. Hmm, yeah, so yeah, the, the big advantage of using a data set, guys, is that you are able to process it. Yeah, you store it in memory, which means you're able to, you are able to store the relationships in memory. You're able to restore every, you store the actual table, right? You store data tables and data rows and data columns. Okay, but so you're storing the entire thing in memory. You're able to manipulate it and adapt it, okay? Always associate, like, what do we use to fill a data set? We use a data adapter, okay? We use these data sets to adapt data, to, to manipulate it in like a very specific ways, okay? I'm um, in complex ways. Here they tell you the application must move through the data sequentially and process each item once. So what's another way of saying that, guys? What term are we more familiar with? That means you must move through the data sequentially processing each item once. What was that one term, that one word that... Um, C sh that Visual Studio used to describe all of these classes, um, like the, the, the data reader, the stream reader, the binary reader, the XML reader. Yeah, Maya, that was it. Forward only. Forward only. Okay. So you move through the data sequentially, processing each item once. That's what these readers are good at. That's what they're made for. Um, you just read through the items. You process the one. You process the one. There's no going back. You just process, 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 process. Okay. Um, so that's what these data readers are good for, okay. Um, yeah, so D. On to question six. Um, oh, this one was so weird. Um, the application you are developing needs to read data from a flat file that includes items such as a, be careful about this one, guys. Um, from a flat file that includes items such as a five digit key, a 20 character name, followed by two date time fields. Which of the following classes should you use? Now, I think this question is very silly. Um, I almost just want to skip it and put my own question or, or like another, another question. Um, let me put it this way. They're suggesting, so I agree. If we stopped at five digit key, yeah, this is why I don't like this question. So if we stopped at five digit key and 20 character name, then it's obviously B. If we stopped at five digit key and 20 character name, especially with the name, you almost certainly want to, a name specifically, you almost certainly want to use a text file, okay? But what they're suggesting is that because there's these date time fields and the five digit key, this is probably not going to be human readable anyway, okay? Like a human is not going to ever need to read this, in which case, okay, yeah. So with that extra piece of information, they're assuming like this dot date time field is like a more complex type. You're not going to be opening it in the text file. Only the application is going to be interested in it. Um, and so with that extra information, you can see that it would be C. Okay. But the, yeah, this, this question, I really don't like. Um, it's, it's very silly. I, I haven't seen this asked before in any of the past tests that I've seen. So it's, I guess it's fine. Maybe, maybe they, someone um, at the MTA or Microsoft, or whatever, agreed that this is a bit silly. Hopefully that's the case. Um, since this edition of the book was made. But this question is very vague. Um, if you don't know 
like how they're thinking about date time fields. Although, okay, so the five digit key, it like if you're storing just a random number, like an ID, you can you can assume that human readability is not relevant to you, right? It kind of makes sense. You wouldn't, um, you're not gonna be opening the text file and reading them basically, okay. But yeah, ah. They should have just made this like clearer because then they would actually be testing your knowledge if they said like you're storing a profile picture or something like that. That makes it way better. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a silly question. Don't worry about too much about that one. Okay, question seven. Uh, this one, this one's fine. You are developing an application that will need to copy data from an SQL server view to a data set. Um, just, just see like a response to a query instead of view. So like a result, for example. Okay, or um, just see it as database. Okay, SQL server database to a data set. You name the data set DS data. Which of the following methods should you use to copy the data? So we're copying the data from the server to a data set. Yeah, okay. it, it is a, okay. Um, these other ones, so update, you can, use to, you can use to update a data set from like another query. So that's that's this one's relevant. Um, these other two you can ignore. Okay, so uh, updates is relevant. Um, like if they said you have an existing data set that has information in it and you want to change some of it, then you might say updates instead. Okay, um, but that's almost self-explanatory. But the main thing is, yeah, whenever we're populating a data set the first time, fill that's the go-to and that's the one you must prioritize. Okay, because they do ask a lot of questions um, about this, as you'll see in a little bit. Okay. Question eight, you are developing an application that manages customers and their orders. Which of the following situations is not a good candidate for implementation with stored procedures in your application? Which of the following is not a good candidate? <laughs> okay, A, retrieving the list of all customers in the database, okay? Retrieving the list of all orders for a particular customer. C, insert a new order into the orders table. Or D, ad hoc querying by the database administrator. Okay, this one is actually quite easy, easy if you know what the term ad hoc means. Okay, because they almost tell you. Uh, if you know what the term ad hoc means, then this is a fairly easy uh, question, I think. Um, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, right. I mean, in a way, I just told you the answer as well. Let me just read you. Uh, ad hoc means when necessary or, uh, okay, hold on. I didn't, when necessary or needed. Okay, when necessary or needed um, or created or done for a particular purpose as necessary. Okay, so this is like, it's basically like saying, when would you want to store the procedure? Like, what queries would you like to store on your database? If you're working with customers and orders and you're working with these a lot, would you like a way to very quickly, very easily retrieve all of the customers from your database? Of course, you would want to easily be able to retrieve all of the customers from your database. Would you like to be able to retrieve all the orders for a particular customer from your database very quickly and easily? Then yeah, you would create a procedure for it. That makes sense. You would want to be able to do that. Um, Inserting a new order into the orders table, definitely, right? Like every single time you, you get a new order, you would definitely want that to be a quick process to just add the, add the next order. So you would want that to be a stored procedure. And you would need that to be fast as well, okay? Oh, that's the other thing to remember about stored procedures, guys. It's not just that it's easier, they're faster, okay? Because the, the, the way it performs that query is cached, okay? So it's, it's also faster to run um, stored procedures, especially for like these large queries, okay? Um, and then option D is like basically saying, whenever the database administrator wants to do a random thing, like they wanna do some random query that's necessary for some reason, would you want that stored as a procedure on the database? No, okay? Obviously, like you don't just want any old thing, like any old query that the database, administra a database administrator makes to be as a stored procedure, right? Um, so yeah, ad hoc basically just means when necessary, um, like just, um, yeah, on the fly basically. So if, if it said that on the fly querying by the database administrator, then you would maybe see very easily 
that that should not be a stored procedure, right? Because the database administrator is going to be doing a lot of things that don't need to be done often. Ad hoc, does it stand for something? I mean, I'm sure the, the etymology, um, oh, so it's Latin for to this. Um, yeah, to this basically is apparently what it means, to this. Okay, uh, but yeah. Cool, so on to the next one. Um, this one, I, I have told you the answer to this question before. Your application connects to an SQL server database that contains a table called employees with the following columns, employee ID, employee type, and employee date. You need to write a query that deletes all rows from the table where employee type is either C or T. Which of the following would you use? Hmm. Okay, so basically, the thing they're asking about is the last two portions of the query. So it's always delete, de delete from employees where employee type, and then your choices are like CT, like C-T, like C or T, or in CT. So I have told you guys before, how in SQL? This one can be tricky, but for a very, spe a very specific reason. Okay, C or D, C, hmm. This is why, questions like this is why I didn't want to show you guys that the words or and and exist in, in SQL. <laughs> yeah, so remember, so or does exist. Like you could say where employee type equals C, or employee type equals T. You can do that, um, but you can't just say like C or T. Okay, Like C or T is not gonna give you the result you expect um, because this is like saying, hmm. I, I'm, I don't even know what this pattern would mean. I think this would just always be true, actually, is how SQL would in interpret this. Um, or, or this would say wherever wherever the character C or T is contained, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how SQL would interpret this like statement. Um, the, I know these first two like statements just are, are, not, are not relevant. Um, the, this is not how you display patterns. It's not how I showed you to display patterns. And this one I have told you, it is in, okay? You give it a list. Okay, so let's, I, I mean, let's, let's play with this a little bit and see, uh, see what happens, okay. Um, so we're gonna use select instead, just because, you, I mean, you can imagine to use delete, okay? So we can say, um, if we want, we could say like where, so the correct way of doing this, you can say like where name in, let's say we want to get out uh, Ali and or, okay? So we would say Ali comma or. So you can give a list of all of the possible options. And when it's in that list, it will give you the result back, okay? So you see this gave us back Ali or or, okay? And anyone that had the name Ali or or, it would give back, okay? So it's like saying Ali or or. So these like ones, I've shown you how to display certain like patterns. I did mention to you when we, when we discussed it a little bit, it's impossible to go through them all, guys. There's like a whole language in just defining patterns in computers, okay? Um, so it's li it's quite literally impossible for us to go through them all. Um, this, you could, we, I forgot what this is called. Is it called radicals? Uh, I do think we have, def we've, we've seen enough SQL patterns. I don't wanna get too bogged down in learning all of the different likes. Um, let me just figure out, I forgot what they call this. I think they call them SQL radicals or something. Um, but yeah, we can just use patterns, I guess. Escape, escape character. Any single character not within a list or a range, the character to character, any single character within a specified range, list of characters. Um, okay, okay, that's that makes sense. So we can do 
like it is possible to do um, this. So in, in to, to define a pattern, you could say something like this. So like that would be any character between A and F, okay? Like alphabetically almost, okay? So you can do this kind of thing. In general, they, wo they won't have expected you to learn this like secondary language of how to define patterns. Do know the ones I showed you, right? You guys remember what underscore means? Does anyone remember what underscore means? What does underscore represent in a pattern? Space. Hmm. First letter. Remember, can any single character can replace this? Okay, any single character. Um, it, it would be interesting to see. So I think if we change this to char one, oh, I think I might end up confusing you guys here though. I change name to char one and I make it so that this one's A, this one's O, this one's D, this one's K, and this one's P. Oh, uh, will that run now or will I have to put them in single quotes? Okay, no, it does work. Um, so we can, I guess we're going to do this. Okay. So you can see that first letter, okay. Yeah, yeah, so so underscore means any singular character. Um, and you can see this doesn't, this doesn't work. What they specified does not work, okay. Um, you can see we've now got A and O. Um, you can see that practically this does not work in SQL. Um, the answer is in CT, okay. This is how you should do this. And the like and, and or also won't work, so I can show you that now as well. Oh, um, maybe, I mean, we can try single quotes, I guess. Um, uh, okay, yeah, doesn't work. Um, so, and uh, this won't work in any any modern version of SQL. And then the the next thing is to say um, this this or one. So if we said like, like C or T, um, so I, I only changed, ooh, uh, like, like A or O, let's say, sorry, or O. Uh, yeah, because that's a little more. Okay. Um, okay, see, it just returned O. So it only used the first one, like A. It didn't use the or O. Because this, okay, that that's a good way of explaining it. The thing on the right side of the or needs to be a condition, okay? Like if you said like A or like O, I think this, this will work. Um, although this is getting very weird, like you wouldn't do it like this, right? You shouldn't do it like this, but this might work, okay? Um, it doesn't, okay? So you can't say or like, huh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, um, you can, you could do like name equals A or name equals O, that would work, and I've shown you that before. Um, but yeah, the, the correct way to do this in or statements is in, okay? Maybe if they are in brackets. Uh, that means list. So like if for like, if you put things in brackets, it means like a list. Okay, I, I think we can show it maybe somehow. Okay, that one won't work. Uh, if I say A2O, will that work? Hmm, okay, let's try if we switch it over to Varchar. Ah, no, okay, no, none of it's working. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways to display these patterns. I mean, the conditions in brackets. Oh, the conditions themselves in brackets. Uh, let me picture it quick. I mean, we can try it. We can try it. Or like, oh. Uh, so you want it like, like this. I don't think brackets work this way in SQL, unfortunately. I agree it is neater. But no, I don't think this will have that effect. Maybe, no, no, so same same error. Uh, we can see like SQL version, write syntax to use near like A or like O, yeah. So yeah, you're supposed to define a singular pattern. Um, but yeah, interesting. But the main thing to remember about all of this is that in order to say or, you basically just say in. Okay, so in and you give it a list of possibilities, okay. So in CT will say either C or T, okay. And you, 
Uh, maybe you can't have more than one like in a query. Yeah, that, that would make sense to me because it, it is for defining a particular pattern. Okay, it is for defining a particular pattern. Um, you can, hmm. yeah, okay. But we, we can, we maybe we'll go through more de pattern defining things later, I guess. Um, but this is fairly, uh, I, the, the question, so the other possibilities, understanding what they're trying to represent here due to all of the different versions of SQL that exist, um, it would be, it would take long to get through. Um, but but uh, in CT, this one I have shown you, um, so you should be fairly confident about the question itself, okay? Um, ignoring the rest of these options, um, okay? But yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways to use like, there's a lot of ways to define these patterns, okay? And this one, last question, wow, perfect timing as well. So your application includes a SQL data adapter object named adapter that connects to the customer's table. Okay, so the name of the table is customers, the name, and we have an adapter. Based on this adapter, your application also includes a data set called the DS customers, DS customers. What line of code would you use to load the data from the database into the data set objects? Okay, um, so I did tell you they do like asking questions about fill, so you must know how to use fill. Okay. Um, so which option is it here? I showed you guys this last lecture. It was the last thing we covered. Um, okay, someone says C, interesting. Um, anyone else, any other options? Someone says B, okay. What does it mean for something to be in quotes? Yeah, it's a string. So if we look at B, it says adapter.fill. And then it gives us the name of the data set. Right? But the name of the data set is in quotes. But the data set is an object, right? We need to be referencing the object itself. Like you wouldn't, um, if I was saying... Basically what they did there is the equivalent of me going like, uh, if I created a rectangle, like a, obviously it won't work now because I, I deleted the class. Okay, so like this. So if I've got my class back here, if I created a rectangle, rectangle rect, okay, that's fine. I, I wouldn't reference it like this. Right? I would reference the objects like, like that. Okay. So remember, data sets an object. So it is, if it is already connected to customers, it would be B. Otherwise, it would be D. Okay, interest, interesting option. Okay, yeah. What line of code? So remember, it's saying what line of code would you use to load? What kind? What line of code would you use to load the data from the database into the data set object? Okay, I, I think we've maybe think thought about this one for, uh, a little bit. So so let's go through it. So DS customers equals adapter dot fill customers. Okay. This one is just not how adapter.fill works. It doesn't return the data set, okay? You have to give adapter.fill the data set you want to populate, okay? Okay, so uh, let's just go through the options and see, okay? So DS customers equals adapter.fill customers. So here, this is assuming that .fill will return a data set, which it won't. .fill won't return stuff, it'll just, you need to give it the data set that it is loading into. Okay, so it's not A. Uh, B, adapter.fill DS customers in quotes. So that's not an object. Comma customers, which is the name of the table that we want to fill, um, fill DS customers with. Okay, so this one, it looks somewhat okay, but the problem is this is in quotes. Okay, this is in quotes. So the fact that this is in quotes suggests that the... Um, it's, it's giving a string as the name of the object, but the data set is called DS customers. It's the name of an object, okay? C, adapter.fill DS customers, okay? And D, adapter.fill DS customers, comma, customers in quotes, okay? So it's, it's an interesting thing here. So adapter.fill DS customers, it is giving it the object that's the data set, DS customers, okay? The problem is that it's not saying Remember, the, 
the adapter holds an entire response from a query. It can hold multiple tables. It can hold relations. It can hold lots of stuff, okay, anything. So the adapter could be holding a lot of different stuff, and it doesn't know what you are trying to fill the data set with. If you just say adapter.fillDS customers, it doesn't know what part of the query to use to populate the data set. Okay. Um, and so adapter.fillDS customers, so that's saying what data set are we filling? Comma customers, that's the name of the table that we are filling the data set with. Okay. And so yeah, it is, it is D. Okay. And that is it for the chapter six knowledge assessments. Um, sorry, we did go like two minutes over time. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but yeah, that's it for today. Um, cool. Well done. I, yeah, it's uh, glad, glad we could finish it. I'm surprised it took us the whole lecture. Sorry, I, I didn't expect that, which is why I said it. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect it. Um, but yeah, cool. That's it. Have a good November, guys. Good luck on your exams. Enjoy your weekend. See you at the end of the no at the end of November for all our revision sessions. Remember to work through the database modules. I will post reminders. Um, if you're ever feeling a little bit bored, if you want to do something other than your exams, you can work through those. Um, I said some information during the break about the exam. That's basically everything I wanted to tell you about it. So we don't have to cover that now. Uh, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank all of you. Also, have a good uh, weekend. Uh, so enjoy weekend. Thank you. You too, Amulka. Cheers. Um, yeah, cheers, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure. And thank you guys for coming. See you all in long, like next month, end of next month.